All right, team coach Dana Cavalier here with you on the Becoming a Champion show. And today I had an amazing guest. She is the founder of this, Hint Water. Many of you may have seen that bottle and it's truly amazing. And she's also the author of this great book called Undaunted. I keep both on my desk at all times. And Kara Golden gave us some amazing lessons today that I know will help you in your journey to believe in yourself, believe in your passion and how you can take your passion and turn it into a thriving business like she did. She was looking to solve a problem like all great entrepreneurs, and she figured out how to how to do it. And that is what gave birth to this awesome product, Hint. So sit back, enjoy today's episode. I know you're going to love it with Kara Golden. I actually have a longer history with you than you, than you may know. Uh-oh. <laughs> so I figured I'd kick off with that. So one night, here I am, I'm traveling with the New York Yankees. I'm a coach there, and I'm watching... TV and I come across this, I, I guess it was an episode on you. And I it was called How I Made My Millions. And there you are. I remember that well. Yeah, it's so, more like so, how I spent my millions. Yeah, that's us- usually that's usually how it goes. So <laughs> so I'm watching it and and I'm sympathizing with everything that you're saying and I'm loving it. So we get back to New York and I I call you guys, somebody within your organization, and for the next few years. We had pallets and pallets and pallets of hint water sent to the stadium. So that's that's how I came in touch with you and the brand, and um, and it went. It was awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. No. I. I. Uh, and I know it was. It was always a little shaky because it's uh, you have to be careful with some of the sponsorships and and people wanting to drink water. They can bring in whatever they want, right? Nope. But it was it was always. Um, and I I remember hearing from a lot of the players, frankly, over the years that they just loved it. Yeah, it was great. I mean, we we got in trouble quite a bit for putting it in the dugout when uh, you know, with the sponsorship stuff, but but we did our best. But inside we were we were fueled by uh fueled by hint. That's awesome. So well, so it's very you. cool. That's yeah, yeah that's great. But um the other thing is I'm I'm reading this book, I'll hold it up. And uh, you're the lady on the cover, but uh, undaunted. And I've enjoyed it because there's there's this common theme that I that I've learned about you, and it's that you're not afraid to to go after it. You're you're constantly. I, I was saying, and I come from again sports, where I'm like, you got to play offense. You got to be on the attack. You got to play offense. So as I'm going through the book, I'm finding these instances of where you just you literally put yourself out there and you just reach out to people and you just push to make it happen. Yeah. And I think it's, it's a story of, um, you know, I was in sports growing up and, and I think that, I mean, there's so many lessons that you learn from, from sports, uh, and, you know, everything from being a team player to, you're always going to find someone that's better than you to, Mm -hmm. you know, if you don't try, then you won't succeed. And I think that taking those lessons and bringing them into business um, you know, I think this is true for entrepreneurs, but I, I think it's particularly true for female entrepreneurs. Most female entrepreneurs that I've met have played some sort of sport at least through, you know, mid high school. Mm. And it's it's fascinating. And many of them, you know, into college and and a couple of even pro um, in lots of different industries. But I think it's this emphasis on on just kind of going out and trying and then, you know, getting up the next morning and, and trying again. And it's, uh, it's, there's a lot of lessons that you can learn in sports at, and relate it to business, but, um, the, the getting knocked down piece and, and not allowing that to stop you. Um, but instead looking at it as, as almost like a puzzle to just that it's yours to figure out is really, you know, yeah. critical. And as you, as you put your puzzle together and you put the pieces of this business together, you know, there weren't, weren't really any comparables in, in this category. You, you really created the category. Oh, yeah. If you still water, right? Yeah. Well, it's, it's called unsweetened flavored water. And so okay. I knew when I launched the product that it was, you know, I was launching a product and I was launching a company, but what I didn't know was that I was launching an entirely new category. Mm. And I think that the, the important thing for people to remember when you're thinking about that is that when you're launching a new category, you not only need to educate the consumer as to why they need your product, but in our case, 
you know, and maybe in any other industry, you've got a gatekeeper that mm. like the grocery store buyers were our gatekeeper. Right. And so I'd go to them and I'd say, Hey, I've got this brand new product. No one's doing it. It's an unsweetened flavored, flavored water. I would share my story with them. Uh, but still they, they looked at the fact that I was the only one doing it. And I was creating this new category as what if the consumer doesn't want it? I mean, you yeah. want it, yeah. but yeah. what if the consumer is just sitting inside of, you know, San Francisco and, they're just a little weird, right? And they just yeah. do their own thing. And and so, I mean, it's a story of, and again, you could take this across multiple different, different industries, but it's a story of sometimes competition is not such a bad thing, right? Mm. If there's only, you know, one team in, a, in an athletic, um, uh, you know, competition, then you don't really have a team, right? Yeah. Or, or you don't have an industry. You have to have competition and then figure out how do you differentiate yourself. And yeah. I think there, there's a lot of lessons even that you can learn from that too, including the fact that, you know, when competition will come around, then it's, you know, you can close down shop or you can actually say, okay, well, here's what we do really well. Here's yeah. what we need to work on and figure out, you know, how to stay true to the people that have been supporting you, mm. the people that really understood you early um, and not waver. So I think that, that that's the key thing that, that I've learned over the years too, even, you know, you're always going to have competition come in. Sometimes competition looks like you, they're a, they're a, you know, in our case, and unsweetened flavored water that is under a different brand name. Mm. Other times they have their own private label brand. They have a competitive advantage because they're, they have a, you know, grocery store name on their bottle, but then they also have the ability to take lots, lots of space. Yeah. And yeah. so how do you compete against that? I think more than anything, you figure out how you can differentiate your distribution. Hmm. Right. You still show up, you still, you know, try and, and stay in those situations to show the consumer yeah. that yeah. we're actually better. We're a better tasting product. We're, you know, we might have less, but you know, there's nothing wrong with supporting the underdogs, whatever that is right. along the way. And it just doesn't mean that it's, you know, it's not over till it's over. Yeah. I, I think all of that, those oftentimes is the reason why people don't get in the entrepreneur game. You know, some people, they overthink it yeah. so much and well, there's competition, there's no competition. It's like, well, that's why I can't start. So either way, they've already put a buffer in or a reason why they can't, they can't start. But for you, you know, just, just starting this thing, I'm sure like any other business, you know, people see where you guys are now, but it started very organically. It started very simply, right? right? The labeling, the bottle, it wasn't as beautiful as it is now. Totally. And, and I think, you know, that's, that's the case with most small companies. It's, I, I love when I run into people and, you know, they bring up our first bottle had a clear label. Mm. It had a sports top because I don't know if you remember sports tops, but that, I mean, that was very common. Yeah. And it ends up that it was three times the cost Wow! to do, you know, like, and, but we thought it looked beautiful. It actually looked not very beautiful. It was too tall. There were a lot of like challenges with it. And of course we weren't blowing our own caps at the time. And so it was, we were just paying whatever we could get our hands on. And, and that was three X, you know, the, the amount that a flat cap was. So again, there, there's things that you learn along the way. Um, but more than anything, you just, you know, that you just have to keep trying things. And mm -hmm. I mean, that's another thing that I think I learned in tech more than, you know, even being in the beverage industry is that, you know, when you think about tech, they've sort of trained the consumer to think about, you know, there's an upgrade 2.0, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. You know, yep. there's, there are iPhones that are sitting inside of, you know, Apple right now that are, you know, three ahead right now, yeah. probably behind in some safe somewhere and they're almost <laughs> baked, right? But they're not quite there yet because they're waiting 
to really watch the consumer, as Steve Jobs always said so eloquently, he didn't ask the consumer what they wanted. He showed them. Mm. And so right now, the iPhone, he's he's watching how the consumer reacts, mm. but it but he's develop he he is putting out a good product and seeing how they interact with it. And that will go into the next iterations of the product. Yet in cons- in the beverage industry, you know, you look at it, they typically a brand is launched like, a, you know, pick on Pepsi or, or yeah. Coke, you, you know, go and launch it. And then it's like, it was either successful or it failed. Right. And then they bring it back. And there's this huge emphasis on it's back, right? We've, we've now brought it back. And the tech industry, they just keep making it better time mm. after time by getting the consumer used to the fact that there's 2.0 coming, there's an upgrade coming. Yeah. And, uh, and so having that thinking from the tech industry and bringing that into the beverage industry, no- knowing that our labels are pretty good, but we're going to learn a lot more once we get it out there. So let's not buy too many. Mm. Let's launch it with this, with a, you know, cap that costs three times more. Um, just to see if the consumer is really that interested in it ends up that they weren't. Yeah. You know? And so all of these things are really seeing how the consumer responds versus doing a focus group to ask the consumer, what do you think? Like I've mm. never really thought that that was the right answer. And over the years, I've spent a lot of money um, doing focus groups that prior to Hint. And yeah. I've always thought, these consumers are really smart that come into these focus groups. They know what we're asking, right? And they want, mm. they'll, they don't know how they'll respond until they're actually asked to purchase something. So yeah. that's fast. It's, it's fascinating. It. It's, it's, it's just, again, uh, what I love about the story is just how, you, again, it, it's, it's, you had a, you had an idea and then you executed on it, but it wasn't, you weren't, were you totally sold on every part of it or were you, were you saying, Hey, we're like, you're saying here, you constantly were open to the adjustment, open to the pivot, open to, you know, I didn't come into this industry to start a beverage company. So it's, you know, something I, I talk about a lot. I mean, it was, it was, I was in tech and enjoying my time in tech, but I had taken a couple of years off to be a mom and Mm. had young kids. And while I was, really, you know, getting used to being a mom, which I always share with people. It it was the stupidest I've ever felt in my life was when I became a parent, (laughs) right? I'm trying to figure out how to put a diaper on. And, you know, even though I babysat, like when I was in high school, I mean, that for me was, you know, just when they're your own kids, you want to do everything right. You want to feed them right. You want to make sure that they have everything, Mm. the right stroller, all of this world, right. That was just like, Oh my God. Yeah. And, um, and for me, I felt like I cared so much about my kids and what I was, you know, doing for them that I I stopped for a minute one day and I thought, if I really want them to have this great life and be healthy, don't I also have to be healthy? Mm. And I wasn't that healthy. I mean, I had gained a bunch of weight over the course of many years of pregnancy. I, d- my energy levels had just like gone down significantly, as I mentioned. I was an athlete growing up, a big runner and also gymnast and, and had felt like I really knew how to work out and was continuing to work out. But, but for some reason had, you know, these problems with my health that I just Mm. assumed were because I'm getting older or as one doctor said to me, Oh, you had kids too close to one another. And that's why this is happening. And I thought, well, what am I supposed to do now? I mean, you know, kind of a little late to to share that with me. (laughs) And so it was at that moment when I thought, I, I'm going to figure this out. So I tried a bunch of different diets. I had never dieted in my life. And I realized that like counting calories and trying to figure out what worked with your system was really hard and mm. confusing. And there were lots of different diets in the industry overall, I thought was very confusing. Um, and then the drink that I had been drinking for so long, diet soda, diet Coke in particular, mm. was for me, diet meant health. Um, yeah. I, 
I always think about this. I mean, here's here's another thought for the day on this Monday um, that I, when you think about the word diet, I mean, I don't know, maybe you get a vocabulary test when you're in, it's a four letter word, maybe it's second grade, right? You get this, this word diet. You think of diet as kind of a bummer, right? It's yeah. not a positive word. And yet by the time you go into high school and, and that's when the soda companies target, mm. particularly teenage girls, that is where all the media is bought to target teenage girls. Diet becomes a solution. Mm. It, it becomes a positive thing that, you know, they've figured out that that's the time that teenage girls and boys too, but predominantly girls, let's go and figure out a way to focus and get them focused on health. Mm. We'll call it diet. So instead of regular soda, let's call it diet soda. Mm. And where does that turn in, in the way we process a word mm. come from? And mm. sadly, as you know, I mean, athletes are used, um, you know, in, oh, yeah. influencers, celebrity endorsement deals. And many of those people don't even drink these products. No, right? no, they just stack up in the, in the and corner somewhere. They stack up in the corner somewhere. And, but again, the consumer, it's like this healthy perception versus healthy reality. And so yeah. again, I wasn't working at the time and I'm sort of absorbed in this whole, like, you know, big thought process of, well, what about the consumer like me that had been drinking this stuff for years, finally switched from diet, diet Coke to plain water and dropped 24 pounds in two and a half weeks, my skin, my adult acne that I had developed that never sort of put the two together. I'd always thought I kind of suck because I've got all this extra weight. Plus I've got bad skin mm -hmm. and plus I've got low energy. And, yeah. and I never connected that they were all kind of part of the same. And when I finally figured out that switching from diet Coke to plain water helped me to clear all of those things up. I, that's when I really thought, wow, I've figured out a solution. I can take this to a lot of other people mm. and help them. I never stopped and said, I'm going to go develop a beverage. Instead, I, I thought we just need to tell everybody that they should be drinking water. Well, in my own life, I saw this problem that the reason I didn't drink water, I grew up in Arizona. I should have been drinking a lot more water oh, yeah. was because <laughs> water is boring. And that is the reason why people, people know that they're supposed to drink eight plus glasses of water a day. We've been told over yep. and over and over again for years. And the people that don't do it feel that it's boring. Yeah. And oh, that's yeah. it. It's not that complicated. And so I, know, I, I have a father like that. I was like, dad, you got to drink the water. He goes, I don't like the taste. That, and that's what it is. And for me, I got marketed to yeah. in high school. And that's when I started drinking diet soda. There are people who also shift to uh, you know, vitamin water, enhanced waters. There's a million of them out there too that are, you know, kind of in the same camp where yeah. you know, I wasn't a vitamin water drinker 17 years ago when I developed this company. I had friends who were drinking vitamin water and I would ask them, like, what do you like about the product? And they say it's healthy, it's vitamins mm -hmm. and water. And then I'd say, Have you like read the labels? Because I mean, at that time they didn't even have a diet version of vitamin water. It was, yeah. you know. It was well, it's actually crazy that you say that because a diet version of vitamin water. Yeah. I mean, right? and, <laughs> totally. And it was just, I mean, it was crazy that I, and again, they, you know, they sold a lot of that stuff to, oh, yeah. to this day, but I think it's because the consumer has a lot of trust. I mean, mm. and, and again, I go back to this concept of words, like words are really, really powerful. Yeah. And how they trick the consumer into believing that somebody is watching out there. Yet, so many of these companies, you know, with there's been all kinds of controversy over the years of is vitamin 
tricking the consumer into believing it's healthier than it is, mm. is the word diet. I believe it is. And I think yeah. you would ask many people walking down the street, like, what do you think? And I think most people would think that a full sugar Coca-Cola is way worse for you than a diet drink. Yet there are many people today who think that, you know, the brain is actually harmed even more by these diet sweeteners because yeah. you're still producing insulin. Um, today, you know, type two diabetes is 40 to 45%, depending on who you ask percent of the population has uh, type two diabetes or pre-diabetes. Wow. And yet Amazing. So many of those people are athletes. Hmm. They're drinking diet, thinking, eating low fat, thinking that they're doing better. And, you know, many doctors today who really study it are saying, that's interesting. Maybe it is the diet sweeteners. And yeah. so very, very crazy world, um, you know, that I lived in, but it was not, I never said, I want to go start a beverage company and this is what I'm going to do with my career. I felt like I had this purpose and this, this reason for sort of doing what I was doing every day. And the last thing I'll say is that hearing from consumers and having that direct connection to consumers, I kept thinking, okay, every time there was a challenging time, a hard time, a failure, I thought I, if I quit, kind of like being an athlete, then who's depending on you? Is your team depending on you? Mm. Is, your, is your consumer depending on you? And that, would, that got in the way that of me ever quitting because yeah. I kept yeah. thinking if I go away tomorrow, yes, I may be ahead of the industry and ahead of what other people are thinking. And it's a hassle and it's the hardest job I've ever had in my life. Mm -hmm. But if I can actually help people to get healthier, and that's what I do every single day, that's just pretty damn cool. And as a parent, I also thought that's, that's something that I would want my family to know that I worked really hard to achieve, even if I failed. Yeah. That I was, you know, even if I was called crazy and did really stupid stuff, hopefully didn't go bankrupt, all of those kind of <laughs> things, I thought, I want to, what's my legacy? What is my, how am I viewed? And mm -hmm. I think that that is such a, that was the driving force for me. Yeah. No, I love that. You know, I meet so many, you know, business leaders today. And and you don't present this this vibe, but they're they're almost burnt out and shot from from building what they've built. But I, but I also think that they probably come at it from a little bit of a different angle. For you, it's like, hey, I have this message I want to share. I never intended to do this. I've just sort of been called to do it, and and every day I just move closer and closer to that. How how have you balanced really not getting into that state? Well, first of all, I think there's there's so many, um, you know, as you're as you're on your journey, as I share with people, you know, you're humming along, and mm -hmm. and if you see yourself going left, and maybe it's you make a mistake, you don't want to make a mistake twice, right? Mm -hmm. Because that becomes a pattern. Instead, mm -hmm. you have to know, okay, maybe we should be going right, right? You have to. It's very exhausting because you have to be so you know, uber aware of every single move along the way as you're, as you're kind of in training, I guess, like as, yeah. you're, as you're moving along. And I think that so many people get themselves into a situation too, where while you're on that move, you are so dependent, right? You might be dependent on the money you took, right? Mm. The type of money um, you might be dependent on the fact that it's, you know, you've got all your eggs in this basket. And if you don't, do something that is, you know, going to be really a bummer and, and that you've got to be able to kind of, you know, figure out options, I guess is, mm -hmm. is the key thing. So building the company the right way. Um, and, you know, I think more than anything, I, I would say three things really are, are the key things that every burned out, uh, entrepreneur comes back and, and talks about it. It's, they took the wrong money. They didn't hire the right people. Um, and then, you know, I think finally it's, 
it's moving in a, it's continuing to move. I mean, even during the pandemic, when you look at companies that are really struggling today, those companies froze and they didn't know what to do. And yet the the people that actually, they might've slowed down Mm. and they might've just sat there and said, okay, what can we do to keep business going? But they didn't stop because complacency will kill you. And I think that that's the most important thing. It's like you you've got to you've got to keep going, and you've got to keep asking yourself, okay, what can I do? And actually, there's a fourth one. I said three, but the fourth one is not having all your eggs in one basket. So having multiple revenue streams into your company, because mm. if you get yourself into a situation where, you know, for example, you're you're just focused on this one store. Um, you know, we had a situation with Starbucks that I talk about in the book where it was, you know, we, all of our energy was going into that store. And then when Mm. they changed strategies, which was great for them, not so great for us, we weren't in the room when it was happening, right? Mm. Instead, we were the recipient of, you know, the downfall. And so that was 40% of our overall business that almost tanked us. Wow. And I'll never do that again, right? You don't make the same mistake twice. Right. But I think that's another reason why I really wanted to write this book was look, it we're a huge company now. We've done a lot of things right, but we've made mistakes along the mm. way. We've had challenges, we've had failures, and the most important thing is you look back at those challenging times and you learn from them and you own them. Yeah. You know, as you say that, you, you said something else, you know, in the book, you know, you said a couple of great things that I like, you know, money wasn't a motivator for you. With, with that, to build a company today of size, do you have to take on money? Or can it go old school where you just, you know, you, you, you start, you sell, and you self-capitalize as you go, and you can still become a big company? It depends on what you want to do. I think that's another thing that people hear like the word VC and they think, Mm. oh my God, I got to go out and get private equity. I got to go get VC money. I've got to go out and get angel investors. It really depends on how big you you want to grow your company and what you want to do. I remember meeting this guy a few years ago, many years ago, probably 10 years ago. And I asked him, you know, who, who had backed his company and, uh, he he actually had a few different companies. It was before even the term side hustle was going on. I mean, he had yeah. multiple companies going on. And um, he said he wasn't raising any money for this one company. And I was fascinated by it. He said, it just kind of runs itself. I hired you know, a CEO for the company so I could go out. And, and I was fascinated by the conversation because he shared that you know his goal was actually to start these multiple companies and really get it off the ground and be the mm. initial build, do the business plan and see if it was going to work. And then he was going to hire people in. He was going to sit on the board, but he was going to hire people in to run the business. And mm. basically, like his dream was that, and and he didn't leave until it got to a point where it was no longer losing money. And then once it was making money. Then he's like, I'm going to go start the next one. Yeah. And it made me think, you know, that company in particular was not going to be a hundred million dollar company. But if your strategy is to, you know, build a $10 million company and there's not that many people, um, maybe you're outsourcing manufacturing, maybe you've got a high margin business, whatever it is, it's really hard to say. Yeah. And- I- and and I, I love that you say that because you know today and I, I don't know if you come across this but I come across it a lot. You know people talk about ten a ten million dollar company like it's nothing, or a twenty million dollar company like it's yeah it's just twenty million and they throw around a hundred million like it's like it's the easiest totally. thing in the world and and that's why I appreciate you you saying that because another thing that you said was like you also have to do what you love and if what you love could may never be a two hundred million dollar company. But you can still have a great company doing you what can. you love. Yeah, and I think it's and I think it's really really key. And that's a lot of money, and you know, to even a million dollars, right? Yeah. And I think that the thing that people don't really think about it, and you know, particularly people who are have never been entrepreneurs, who are just starting out, is that 
you know, when you're going out and raising capital and, and especially big capital, you know, imagine a Shark Tank episode. I mean, you're giving away a lot of the company. And, you know, and, and again, if you think that that's the right thing to do, but that's not always the right thing to do. And I don't think, I think everyone needs to know that it's, you know, there's choices along the way. I really appreciate everybody uh, stopping by and uh, hopefully um, you'll stop by and, and get the book. Um, I'm sure this will be in the, uh, the feed, but it's Undaunted Overcoming Doubts and Doubters. Um, talks all about uh, my journey and in, in building Hint and building an incredible team to help build Hint and um, off, also grab a case of Hint um, that all stores nationwide and also on drinkhint.com and also on Amazon. So thanks for coming, everyone. I hope you guys enjoyed that awesome episode with Kara. She was awesome. She was fired up. She was excited to share her story with all of us. And I know it's very inspirational. And one of the things that I always think about today and many of the people I coach ask me is like, hey, coach, you know, how do I build this big business? How do I build a big business? And what Kara talked about today was you don't have to build a big business. You have to build the right business for you. You have to build something that you're passionate about, that you connect to, and that you align with. And then it will just go. And we don't know how far it will go. And sometimes it just gets us a great salary. For some of us, we get to build an empire. And for some of us, we find some place right in the middle. So as long as you're doing what it is you love to do, you're winning. So don't forget that. As long as you're doing what you love to do and you're following your passion, you're winning. And when you could monetize your passion, that's amazing. So I hope you enjoyed today's show, the Becoming a Champion show. I'll be back with you next week with another great episode. And if you did like it, give us a like, give us a thumbs up, give us a share, and give us a subscribe. This is Coach Dana Cavalier, and I will see you next week on the Becoming a Champion show. See ya.